Mark, thanks for letting me borrow your bike today. Yes, I'm not on Swarf and Chips this week, but you are going to find out why later in the show. Nice bike, Paul. Uh, welcome to Swarf and Chips. Mark, do you think Paul's going to be, uh, you know, checking his hair out in there? Because it's a nice mirrored finish, isn't it? That More bike? to the point, Lindsay. <laughs> Have you seen the suspension settings on that? It seems a little bit low. I wouldn't want to use it after the <laughs> They're so mean to each other. Um, I'd like to welcome on the set today, lovely gentleman who's the um, head of UK manufacturing for Lloyds Bank. It's David Atkinson. Welcome to the show, David. Thanks, Lindsay. Morning. Um, now, uh, just before we start, um, Lloyds Bank, massive company. We're going to discuss a lot about lending, a little bit about post-Brexit and everything like that. But I'd like to ask you, why are you in this industry? Where did you begin? Where did you start? That's a, that's a, that's a long story, but about 30 years ago, um, my dad came out of the services and uh, started work in a sand casting foundry. Um, at, at the time, uh, I didn't have a job when I left school. And quite simply, his, uh, his dulcet tones sort of said, you're not hanging around on the street corner, son, you're coming to work with me. So that's exactly mm -hmm. what I did and spent, uh, spent most of my time with him, uh, wandering around the sand casting foundry, listening to the, the pattern makers, watching them make the moulds, uh -huh. listening to the crack of the metal and uh, being sent to the stores for tubs of elbow grease and a long wait and, <laughs> and things like that as well. So um, fast forward 30 years, um, which is how long I've now worked for, for Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, being brought, uh, brought up and born and bred in the black country and spent most of my time working with uh, small and medium sized businesses around there. Obviously there's a huge amount of industry around there mm. um, and that history has always stayed with me and uh, having the opportunity to develop a strategy and a proposition that Lloyds Bank wanted to do, um, our overarching strategy is to help Britain prosper. We know how important the manufacturing industry is to the UK uh, in helping to create more exports, more jobs, uh, more investment. Um, and the opportunity to develop a strategy, launch it and then lead it, which is what I do now, was yeah. uh, a great opportunity and uh, you know a really exciting one that I feel really privileged to do. So that's yeah. the background for me. No, it's lovely to hear as well. And I think we're going to hear a bit of an example later of uh, uh, like a, a positive story from growth and yeah. exactly what you've done. Uh, may I ask you my first question, what's the biggest challenge um, facing this industry this year? So I think from an industry perspective, um, if you look at all of the reports that come out about how the industry is feeling and what the economic indicators are saying, it's been quite volatile this year. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I guess understandably so, you know, we're facing to a lot of uncertainty following the decision um, to, uh, to, leave, the, uh, to the, leave the EU. Um, we've seen the devaluation of the pound, which has created uh, both opportunities for exporters, but also challenges in terms of the costs for those manufacturers importing uh, their materials. So. Uh, it's a real mixed picture um, and uh, I think some of the challenges that we're seeing our manufacturers face is particularly around their working capital and the management of that working capital. Um, we've started to produce uh, an actual report at the moment to help understand what's going on with those manufacturers and how challenging uh, their working capital uh, position is. And we're starting to see uh, that working capital at the moment with uh, increased infantry levels, increased stocking levels, people taking longer to pay, uh, and also growth opportunities, there's nearly half a, a 500 billion extra cash tied up in the industry at the moment. Um, and of course, that does create um, sort of challenges for, uh, for our manufacturers. So talk to us about this report. So how does that kind of filter down to the company? What, what are you tangibly doing that can help that company kind of improve their working capital and everything like that? So, uh, so first of all, the report. Um, so we've looked back over a number of years using things like the Purchasing Managers Index report mm. to understand uh, trends in the industry. We're seeing uh, our report reveal that uh, working capital is probably at its most uh, sort of demanding at the moment that it has been for almost 13 years. Wow. So, um, you know, it's a significant uh, sort of challenge to businesses and there are regional variations with that as well. Um, what are we doing to help our mm. businesses? Well, we've developed a, an actual working capital management toolkit for our managers uh, on the ground that work with uh, our businesses to actually go through and analyse what's happening with their own working capital, looking at the relationship between debtors, uh, the money that's owed to them, creditors, the mm. money that they owe, and of course the infantry and the stocking and the working capital, uh, the work in progress that they, uh, they have to manage. And then we can help them understand 
One, how they compare to other similar types and size businesses using sort of a benchmarking um, sort of process. But then we can actually show them if they were to help manage certain elements of that, yeah. how they can release cash to put back into their business to support growth, to help buy new kit, uh, to invest in people and training. Um, so, so what you're saying, David, sorry to interrupt, it's not just about the finance side, it's also looking at mm -hmm. the, you know, the whole way of your business structure. It is, absolutely. It's about the non-financial measures and the things that a business can do within their business, mm. not just about the banking and the provision of finance. It's about helping a business culturally uh, help the whole of their business understand the importance of managing that working capital. Thing is, this is what I, I think as well is you've got a lot of companies that maybe you know the father's been working, they've taken on the bit of the business, they're with one particular bank, and that's it. But actually, you're helping as a whole in a different. You know, they're specialist at engineering but you're specialist at what you do. So it's kind of bringing those two relationships together. And even if you tweak in one or two days here and there, yep. that can have substantial implications on a business's cash flow as well. And there's a great success story, isn't there? With Goering, for instance, uh, we, we're, was very privileged to be there on the big grand opening of their factory, but you've helped them, haven't you? Could yeah. you explain a little bit more? Absolutely, yeah, delighted. I mean, as you know, you were there at the at the opening, and uh, and, and Goering is a wonderful business, been established for many, many years, been a client for a long time as well, um, but they had great growth ambitions. Mm. Um, but to do that, they needed more factory space, they needed to invest in plant and machinery to drive productivity. Um, they've got opportunity now, with the support that we've given them, um, with the fabulous new premises they've got, uh, with the big research and development lab that they've got on site now, they've got an opportunity to open up new, uh, new markets, they've got an opportunity to take on and grow their, uh, their, their staff. I think they're looking to put about another 50 people on over the next few years, which is a great story to wow. tell in the local industry. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and of course, uh, opportunities to grow mm. their, uh, their actual business, both in the UK and mm. uh, internationally. So yeah, really, really privileged to be involved with that. So, so over and above helping uh, manufacturers in the UK, um, from a Lloyds Bank point of view, what was you lending 15 years ago to compare to the market now? Well, what we did a few years ago as part of our uh, overarching strategy to help Britain prosper, um, the, uh, the manufacturers told us that there were a couple of things that were really important to them. One was around skills, one was around a banker actually understanding their business, and one was around access to finance. So we made a specific pledge to support the industry by making available no less than £1 billion pounds of new lending to our SME and mid-market businesses every year, just the manufacturing sector. Wow. Um, I'm delighted to say so for the nice. first three years of mm. that, we over-delivered uh, on that promise. Um, and if we look at an accumulative picture, yeah. we're not only on track to deliver another £1 billion of new investment into the sector this year, but we have already delivered our £4 billion over four years uh, sort of five or six months early so uh, you know really proud of what we've been able to do there to support and back uh, you know our manufacturers yeah that right. kind of leads on to my next question because of what you've kind of answered it already but so how are your clients feeling in the current climate today because you've kind of answered it really already well uh, it, it's mixed isn't it i mean there's mm. a, there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a challenge around the uncertainty that they face into uh, and you know we're all familiar with uh, what's going on with the discussions around Brexit at the mm -hmm. moment, and there is so much that we don't know um, yeah. um, <laughs> that, that yeah. uh, you know that will just evolve over time. The one thing I can say, uh, I do have the privilege to spend uh, time with manufacturing businesses almost every day of the week, uh, as do my team nationally, mm. um, and they are really, really resilient. They're really agile, and certainly from an SME perspective, they're almost saying, look, we face uncertainty and challenges as an SME business anyway every day of the week. Let's just get on with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what they are doing. And there's some fantastic success mm. stories out there. Mm. So I guess, uh, in, in summary, it'd be a cautious confidence. But, but also, I think uh, UK engineers should see Lloyds Bank as a relationship. You know, you should be coming to us and say, look, I, I have this challenge. Can you help me? And it's not mm. necessarily just about the finance, is it? No, it's not. And, and, and what we do to help our managers uh, work with uh, manufacturing and engineering businesses across the UK uh, first of all, we created a dedicated team. So we've got around 100 managers from Aberdeen to Penzance, based locally in the local um, sort of communities. We are a relationship bank after all. Mm. Um, and we send our managers that work with the manufacturing and engineering businesses back to university. So they go back to the University of Warwick, trained by the Warwick Manufacturing Group to specifically understand 
manufacturing and engineering. So when mm. they walk in around a factory mm. floor they and, know. The, and they see K K KPI boards, they talk about Kazan, Kanban, Six Sigma, Lean, yeah. 5S, yeah. all of those sorts of things. The language is familiar mm. to them. So uh, yeah. absolutely, um, you know, we would really encourage any manufacturing business, whether they're a client or not, you know, get in touch. We're more than happy to have the conversation with mm. you. And That's good to know, though, as well, David, because you're such a big brand. Sometimes yeah. it can go for and against, in a sense, that you're such a big brand, it's intimidating to contact. But then on the other hand, what you're saying is we are a big brand and that's a benefit to us. But also we do have, you know, that, that, that personal touch with your clients and you are recognising the language is what everyone wants to know. We're, we're, we're a UK relationship bank, mm. you know, and we're here. Uh, you know, to support British businesses. So, you know, our managers, um, you know, they're contactable, uh, their details are on our website, their mobile numbers mm. are on our website, um, you know, and they'd be delighted. When you to say have... on the website, whereabouts do you need to go on the website just for anyone who's watching? So, if you went to the main Lloyds Bank website mm -hmm. and then you go to the business section, yeah. you'll see a specialist uh, sort of banking section with manufacturing, and then there's a contact us um, sort of link on there, and all of our managers. Uh, showing where they're based in the country and their mobile numbers are all available on there. But right. alternatively, contact me. Uh, I don't mind. You know, I, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm here to help. Um, you know, regardless of uh, the fact that we've got a hundred managers around the country, I can easily signpost people. Yeah. Uh, you know, supposedly that's what we do. What a great journey. Yeah. Can I just ask mm. you one more question? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, what are Lloyd's doing to kind of future-proof this industry? Because it's all all well and good as kind of talking about what's happened in the past and yeah. the change and the growth and everything. But is there anything that you can kind of inform us or update us on? You know, future-proofing this industry from your perspective. Yeah, you, you'll you'll have heard the buzzword around um, sort of industry four zero, and really interestingly, our research last year showed that around three quarters of all manufacturers that responded said we've heard of it, but we don't really know what it means to us. Okay. Um, so we've been working with um, a, a number of organisations around the country to help. British manufacturers understand the future mm. of manufacturing, understanding the change in landscape in the way which we design, make and sell things, mm -hmm. using digital technology, using investment to drive automation and robotics, yeah. uh, supporting them with uh, consideration around how do they sell their service as a, prod a product as a service. Yeah. Servitization is another sort of buzzword. So mm. lots, of, uh, lots of sort of support to help signpost businesses to further help to think about how they can develop their business, how they can invest to drive productivity, to take advantage of new opportunities, and of course, uh, expansion overseas, as we've seen uh, most recently, uh, is really sort of growing, and our new international trade portal will help the, uh, those businesses identify new opportunities, which markets to go into, even which businesses will buy their products, and then a wealth of support to help them actually open up those opportunities into new markets. The trade portal, is that something that someone can do online directly with yourselves? What, yeah, they can. We can yeah. either, we, again, our managers will be quite happy to walk through that and do a demonstration with any business, whether they're a client or not. But you can go online um, and uh, the, uh, the international trade portal, it's completely free for our clients. Uh, and for non-clients, you can still get access to it for 30 days completely free of charge, just to get a flavour of the kind of support and help that we offer to help businesses expand and look at new uh, markets in uh, you know overseas okay wonderful and, and i think with your marketing i don't think there's any other lender that i see more in in engineers face i you know you sponsor mac to a certain degree you're, you're involved mm -hmm. with lots of big right. projects and you talk yourself at lots of different things hence why you're on a show today <laughs> oh, thank you yeah, yeah. We're, we're really proud of what we do yeah. and it's a fantastic sector to be supporting and mm. as i say at the heart uh, of, uh, of really helping Britain prosper, uh, you know, rebalancing that economy, yeah. driving exports, driving investment. And, um, you know, we're just really proud of what we do and, uh, you know, we'd like to do more of it. Really. And it was within you as a young lad as well. So yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us on the show, My David. Pleasure. Here's your swarf and chips, mug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you've got to have your best drink. What's your favourite drink? Coffee. Coffee, but you're sorted then, aren't you? All sorted. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, let's go to today's cycle time challenge. Cycle Time Challenge. Guys, we've got a special this week. Normally you'll see a metal component on a new machine, how much time you saved on that. This week though, 3D printing. Look at this. Now we're with the guys from AI Build down in London. Dagan, thank you for having us along. Now normally if you 3D print this, how long would it take? Uh, this would normally take around 10 to 12 hours by a conventional printer. 10 to 12 hours. So the challenge to you guys back at the studio is how long did it take Dagan and the AI Build team to print? MTD on location.
Martin, thank you very much for the invitation here to this uh, new academy. This is the first... You're welcome as always, Paul. You know, you're, you're, you're the first one, you're my favourite. Absolutely, superb. Tell us about the opening and, what, and, why, and why this is happening. Uh, well, this is the first technical academy we're opening, so this is the launch event today. Uh, this is one of 15 that we're going to be opening up and down the country. Um, and yeah, so it's well, I want to know why you've gone down this path. Well, it serves lots of purposes. So first of all, we're using it as a showroom, demonstration facility. So it gives uh, local companies access to the latest, latest technology, latest equipment, uh, so they can come in and kick the tyres, so to speak. Um, but also we're using it as a, our, our own training facility as well for customers that have purchased machines. We'll, they'll be trained uh, in their local technical academy and also supported by Incom with the, apprentice, the, the apprentices. So there'll be apprentices coming through here being taught on the latest technology as well. The, the great thing is we come in here and this you wouldn't know this is any different to Wellsbourne. Was that your plan? Yeah, well, that, that's the idea. You know, we want that uh, common theme up and down the up and down the country. So whatever technical academy you go into, you'll see the same sort of layout and function. Is this Martin's Oil and ETG putting something back into the industry as well, with there being skill shortages? Yes, yeah, so it certainly is. You know, we're 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 a fast-moving company, agile enough to be able to do something like this, and we've got the desire to walk the walk and instead of just talking the talk, which everyone else does. And is it fair to say that your mix of machine tools allows you to do that? You can bring engineers in you know, with a very basic understanding of machinery up to people that, that want to go for full-blown production on multi-axis machines? Yeah, we're, cover we're covering all bases here. So we've got the, the, the Chirons, the Quasars, Nakamuras, Hardinge Bridgeports. You know, there's something for everyone here. As an investment for ETG, what is that investment for you now at this academy and the others as you go forward? Okay, well, for us uh, as a company, ETG, we're upwards of uh, three quarters of a million pounds worth of equipment in this facility. Um, if you add that to the technical partners, um, what they put into into the facility as well, you're upwards of a, a million pounds. And if I'm not based locally around here, when are these other academies going to be opening and where will they be and over what period of time? So we have Aldridge as well, there's an Incoms facility, so they've, they've just uh, bought the building next door to their current trading facility. They want to be up and running by September. We obviously got the Marches that's had a lot of press from yourselves. Um, and there's strategically placed, uh, we're, we're talking in talks with a number of other companies up and down the country. So I, I, I can see by the end of the year we'll have another four open. And it's not all about the machinery, is it, Martin? It's about your, your partners as well. Tell us a little bit about those and the associations and why you've opted for the ones you've got. There's a group of us, basically, we all got our heads together and said, right, OK, we want to make a real-world environment. We want to make um, machining cells. So it's no good just putting in the machine and having a demo of a part that doesn't mean anything to anyone, um, just cutting some material. We want to make a real-world environment. So the, the, the likes of Halton, with their uh, supplying the fluids and lubricating oils, which is a very important part of the machine, Machining process, your WNT and Goering with the with the, the tooling element of it, um, and filter mist of course, Bloom probes, Master Cam, LNS. You know, it, 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 this is basically we're trying to make packages, trying manufacturing packages. And uh, do you ride a bike? Bringing the Norton connection into it. Have you got one? Do you ride one? I can ride one. Yes, I haven't got one currently, but I do hold a motorcycle license. Paul, yes. Thank you very much. So that's it from the opening of ETG's first academy in the UK. Deal of the week. So this is a Matsura H plus 400. Dominic, I see a lot of these horizontals in the marketplace. Not often with the, um, the, the palletization that you've got here. Tell us a little bit about why you've got this added to this machine. Well, what we've got here is, again, on our horizontal lineup, with the success of the MAM 72 power pallet system, the 32 pallet, and again, we offer different derivatives on all the five axis machines. Over the last few years, we've now added this to our horizontal line. So what you get is obviously on our 400 and 500 pallet machines is 15 and 12 pallet solutions, giving you the capability of multi-loading, leaving jobs set, and creating that vending machine type solution that we have been doing on our five axis machines for the last 20 years. I think this is all about education because the more I talk to yourselves and, and other people about the automation and palletization of machines, I can't see why you wouldn't add something like this to a machine of this speed and nature. Would I be right? No, I agree. And I think it is about education. I mean, we recently got a new customer only a few weeks ago that has gone away from a pallet pool to a pallet tower. And 
what they liked about it was that within the same footprint as a pallet pool, they could have more pallets, which meant more lights out running. And for them, weekend unmanned running with nobody coming to intervene to the machine all weekend. So the pallet tower essentially it means you've got more pallets in, in, the, in the same uh, footprint, correct? Correct, yeah. I mean, on this machine, if we look at a pallet pool, which is six pallets, compared to a 12 pallet tower, it takes up no more room. Right, so there's no reason not for go, to go for the 12. Let's come back to the machine. Let, t tell me about some of the reasons why the Matsura is a special horizontal. Again, speed, accuracy, quality of build, reliability. When you put a pallet system onto a machine tool, you have to have a reliable base in which to put the pallet system on. Because obviously if the machine isn't reliable, can run 24 hours, seven days a week, the, the pallet system has no purpose. And how do, you, how do you get those special characteristics on a machine like this? Do you build your own spindles? Do you, do you make your own castings? How does all that work? It all starts with the build. Obviously, the quality of build, the attention to detail, the manual hours of scraping, aligning the, the slideways, the ball screws, the housings. Is that still a practice technique at Matsura? Absolutely. That is a fundamental base of our product, is the pedigree of the way we build machine tools. It's, you might call it old school, but it's what makes the brand what the brand is today. And when you make a machine like that, it's, there's still no compromise in the speed, is there? Because I've seen these things move and they ain't half fast. They are, and the thing is, the faster you go, the more accurate the alignments need to be. And the more you've got to feed it. Well, that's the whole point of buying a multi-pallet, multi-tool machine, is to feed it and make a lot of money. You must sell a lot of these, do you, in the UK, because you're carrying these in stock as well, aren't you? We sell a fair few, yeah. And for people that might say, well, actually, I look at this solution, then this is really what I need, but again, is, is it out of my league cost-wise? Good question. No, it's not, because at the end of the day, we actually sell a lot of these machines to very small SMEs, small subcontracting shops, family-run businesses that enab enables their business to grow, not increase headcount, but make the bottom line a lot healthier. And I think it all comes down to as well, people often say, well, I have to be, I don't have 5,000 off and 2,000 off and 10,000 off. With this sort of solution, you don't need that, do you? You can, you can have smaller, smaller quantities and still be loaded, programs change, different jobs run all the time. Actually, that is, that is the justification that we, that we normally get a customer to buy on because the biggest thing today in a, in a job shop environment is the setup time especially on a vertical or even a twin pallet horizontal, is the amount of time customers take changing over from one job to the next and they never get that spindle cut time back. With a pallet solution, a tool solution, you can create this vending, vending machine style approach where you can have all your jobs set up that are weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, bi-monthly call off, ensuring that the spindle is continuously running and producing. Therefore, this, this investment, yes, it's more money than a twin pallet machine, granted, but it will make far more when that spindle continuously cuts. Thanks for watching this week's Swarf and Chips. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and put your cycle time guess in the comment box below and we'll be announcing the winner next week. If you want to watch any previous episodes, click on the links here. And as we always say, Keep those spindles turning.